Steve Bernstein, and I'm the uh, writer, uh, director, and de facto producer of uh, Decoding Any Partner. You won the Sloan Award this year, right, Steve? Uh, we did. Uh, we did win the Sloan Award, which was uh, a great honor. Um, uh, we're very, very pleased about that. Um, but we're at the Hamptons and enjoying it. We got a standing ovation at uh, our first uh, screening uh, wow. yesterday afternoon, and there's wow. another one in about an hour. So we're very excited. Wow. wow, that's a big deal. And could you tell me a little bit about the intent and the thematic of the of the movie? Well, uh, the film is about two very remarkable women um, who are part real and part uh, the product of uh, my imagination, my son's imagination. We wrote the script uh, together. The very real person is uh, Dr. Mary Claire King, probably the most important scientist that you may never have heard, heard, heard of. Um, and Mary Claire King found the genetic link uh, uh, to a lot of forms of uh, cancer, which have really revolutionized the way that we uh, understand cancer and medicine generally. The other character is Anne Parker, the Anne Parker title, a woman who uh, lives and lived uh, in Canada, uh, had cancer three times and survived it uh, each time. What's really remarkable about these two women is both went on a 15-year journey of uh, faith and belief. That oh, they wow. both believed in individual things. Dr. King believed that there was this genetic link. Anne Parker believed that she could survive. Oh, wow. And uh, both were told they were wrong. Uh, both uh, succeeded. So it's um, a film about overcoming adversity, it's about uh, triumphing over insuperable odds, um, and it's a film about how we maintain ourselves spiritually, physically, psychologically, and at times of an enormous uh, crisis. So, what was the kernel of faith that carried the doctor to research? The doctor King just believed that um, what she believed was wrong. Um, everybody in this patriarchy, this medical patriarchy, this scientific, told her she was wrong. But she was certain there was this link between uh, uh, genetic predisposition and uh, certain types of breast cancer, and proceeded, proceeded to do that research. Yeah, she had to look at uh, hundreds of thousands of, uh, of different women, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish women particularly. Oh, that's interesting. Who have a, that's very interesting. Who have a predisposition yeah. to uh, cancer. And what she would do is she would look at the, uh, the, the these family pedigrees and see where cancer got passed down. And they said, what are we seeing here? What pattern are we seeing? Ultimately, what she discovered is if she looked at early onset cancer, uh, that was probably uh, a genetic uh, cause as opposed to environment because it happens earlier in life. All of us have genes and the genes simply wear out after a certain time. So all of us, if we live long enough, would get cancer. It's a simple fact of life. But what she discovered is by looking at early onset cancer, she could identify the specific gene and that's what led to her very, very important discovery. And your other subject, what, what led her to have the faith to believe she would be better? Um, well, Ann Parker, we don't, I, I, I don't know the source of, of faith. I only know that people have it, and I observe it and how it alters their life. Ann simply believed that she could keep going. So rather than, uh, at least in the character, I should say, there's a differentiation between the real-life Ann Parker and the character I created. The character I created was an amalgam of many different women. But gotcha. what I've observed is those who have a, a positive attitude, those who believe that the world is malleable, that it can be adjusted, they can believe that they can, they can triumph over adversity, are a little bit more inclined to, to, to continue living than those who, who give up on things. And Anne, the character Anne, just kept believing despite uh, all the obstacles that are presented to us. And what brought you to want to in, inquire about or develop this particular theme? Well, you know, I, I, I'm, if you want to write something, you want to write something that's important. And I was interested in the nature of the primal self, uh, what uh, mm -hmm. our genuine nature is. And I think to look at our genuine nature, um, we have to look at uh, it in crisis. Because I think that when things are easy, um, when um, we can be political, when we have the time to uh, look at the things that aren't significant, we do. That's the nature of life. It's sort of like uh, packing for a long journey. You never know what you want to take uh, until just before you get on the plane. Well, there's nothing like um, the presentation of death in your life to realize those things that are most important to put into your luggage. And I think that's what happened to Ann Parker, uh, both the real and the imagined one, is it's presented with, uh, with death, you then look at those things that are important, you finally discover what's important, and it's epiphanal. It changed the way you view life, and that's why I think ultimately people see the film as so uplifting. I mean, first of all, it's essentially a comedy, so I can't help but observe that screening here and uh, in the Seattle Film Festival where we won Best and Fest and we uh, wow. were uh, Samantha Morton got Best Actress Award. Uh, people were laughing through most of the film. Same thing here, people laughed through most of the film. 
I don't think there's anything like death to make you laugh. What you want to do is, uh, when you're presented with those things uh, at the end of your life, you say, okay, what do I enjoy in life? And sex, and humor, and irony, and uh, the love of those closest to us, those are the things that are valuable to us. So uh, I think that um, uh, the proximity of death is liberating. You suddenly realize that our span here is brief, uh, it's precious, and we have to enjoy every single minute of it. So to me, um, ruminating on death is hugely uplifting because it makes me want to enjoy every minute of life and that's what happens to the characters in the film as well. So you're in the now. You have to be in the now. We're in the now and the characters are in the now and the present and understand that life is sensual and delightful and you know we can make ourselves miserable or we can try very hard to make our, our, ourselves so happy. So what other film festivals besides uh, the Hamptons Film Festival? We were we were not a competition at Cannes but we did very well there. We had the Champs-Élysées Film Festival, okay. Seattle where we won um, and then uh, here where we got the Sloan Award. So we're well, doing, uh, you know, kind of remarkably well. That we've is show, remarkable. Showing the film 15 times, 15 standing ovations, wow. um, and uh, you know, a lot of very motivated people afterwards. They stay afterwards. They cry. They laugh. Um, it's been uh, a remarkable experience. I didn't think the film would have this sort of reception. I don't know what it is. It's tying into part of the zeitgeist. I mean, a part, you know, Angelina Jolie um, announcement um, in the summer about uh, her surgery, her op-ed piece in the New York Times. It's the same, uh, that's the same gene that our film's about. The U.S. Supreme Court then did a ruling about a month later also about the same gene. So it seems that... What did they rule? Do you mind if I ask? Uh, what had happened was there was a company called Myriad Genetics who had put a patent on the gene, the same gene gotcha. that America King had uh, discovered. Gotcha. And women were charged about $3,500 to get the test to find out whether they had a predisposition. Uh, there was a woman who protested this, uh, went to court, a federal appeals court, and eventually to the U.S. Supreme Court. And the U.S. Supreme Court overturned it. And it was a Determine that the genes kind of belong to everybody. How did you, when did you start making the film? How long did it take you? Well, I would never spend more than a year making a movie. I told everyone that, which is why I had waited so long to start directing. I was uh, a fairly successful cinematographer. I shot Like Water for Chocolate. I shot, of course, Monster, which won uh, the Oscar with uh, Charlize Theron. Uh, so I had a pretty good life going. Um, uh, I'd won a lot of other awards uh, for cinematography over the years, and uh, I'd always said, look, I don't want to direct because usually it takes uh it takes us uh, seven years, so I'm not going to do that. So some people approach me with some money and said, don't worry, we can get this done in a year. Okay. Seven years later, here we are in the Hamptons. Oh, that's too funny. It was a seven-year project. It always is. Oh, that's too funny. That's very funny. So what would you like to impart to people who may possibly see this? They should come. It's, it's funny. It's enlivening. It's hopeful. I just think that... Um, it ultimately is an affirmation of life. I, I love life. I love every sensual moment of it. And uh, I've been presented like, to, with hardships like anyone else has. Anne Parker, the character, certainly was presented with hardships. Uh, Dr. King was presented with, with great hardships. But ultimately, uh, we have to make choices. And I think uh, making a choice to enjoy life, to delight in uh, its sensual details, its ironies, its humors, um, is what ultimately I'm about and what the film's about. And I think why people are laughing when they see the movie. And what What's your next film? Do you have the next? I do. Um, I'm doing a film called Dominion, which is about uh, Dylan Thomas um, oh, wow. and uh, his last days in the uh, White Horse Tavern. So wow. we start shooting that in about uh, nine weeks. Wow. And uh, we've got a fantastic cast, which will be announced very, very soon in the trade. Oh, you should. that should be a great film for you. I'll bet you you create a mood through visuals unlike anybody else. Well, maybe a little bit through visuals. I think the, the writing, I think what people have found remarkable about decoding Annie Parker is people who love the script in particular. So, um, and the Dylan Thomas film is very much about language. So, um, it's, about, it's about a poet. So, it's um, much a denser sort of prose than decoding Annie Parker was. So, uh, unusually perhaps for someone who's a former cinematographer, uh, I think it's the writing, because I was a writer for 30 years as well, that I'm oh, really falling, okay. I'm falling back on. So, I've written okay. a few books and that sort of thing, a few screenplays. Well, I'm a visual person and I know if the mood of the, of the video or the film is set mm. through the eye of the cinematographer oh. and the director, this draws me in like nothing else, and uh, everything else is a plus. It's all those things together. I think it's like that a again, chemistry. it is. It's, it's again, we talk about sensual nature. I mean, uh, there's nothing uh, to me that's more visceral than a beautiful image. So. It's the good cookie. Yeah, absolutely, right. <laughs> absolutely right. And if people want to find either your uh, production company or this particular project, what site should they uh, visit? If, if they go to the Facebook site, which is Decoding Annie Parker, um, our uh, web page is also imaginatively named. 
Decoding Annie Parker, um, <laughs> the film, or Decoding Annie Parker. Um, and uh, Dominion also has a website uh, coming up very, very soon, so uh, they can find us in, in, in that way. And all the information about the screenings, about the film, about its uh, commercial release next year is all on those web pages. Oh, I, I, I'm excitedly looking forward to seeing further success. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. kindly. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate much. it.